Hey everybody, Kent Martz here. It's Wednesday, it's First Light Chronicles Day, and boy, I don't know where you are, but where I am, it's hot. Although the wind's blowing today here, so it's not quite as bad outside, but when I got in my truck yesterday, parked in the shade, the thermometer showed 109. When I started driving, it cooled off a little bit, but uh, I think we had some record air temperatures set around here, and I know our friends in England are suffering mightily um, you know, uh, were you using the 440 air conditioner? Actually, my truck would have a two, 250, 245, 240, 235, yeah. depending on the speed limit. Yes, all yeah, my pickup truck does have a four, four door, four window, so it would be a four whatever speed, so 450 or 440. But yeah, between here and home, it's 40 miles an hour, so 440 air conditioner. Anyway, it's hot. Our friends over in England are suffering through it, too, as well. I understand the problem they have is, Paul, it's up in the high 80s and 90s, which we're going, oh, that's cool, but only like 5% of the homes in England have air conditioning, and boy, that's tough when you don't have air conditioning and it gets up in the 90s. That's miserable. So... Uh, with us today so far, we have Osmosis 007, Howdy, Howdy Internet Peoples, Good Vibes. Thank you very much, Osmosis 007, for that. And Spencer Collins says, no sound with that. So today, I haven't talked about well, eyepieces could be in a while. sound if Sir? you really waped fast. Like in a, a kung fu movie. So, anyway. Wow. Yeah. Hi-ya. So anyway. Uh, welcome to today's broadcast. It looks like I'm saying stop, stop, stop or something. I just saw myself. The monitor's 10 seconds behind, so I get to see myself in the past. It's no fun. <sighs> so anyway. Always a complaint. It's an observation, not a complaint. It's how you take it. It's an observation. Nothing more, nothing less. So, uh, like a complaint. Spencer Collins says, it sounds just like that. Oh, thank you very much. So we're going to be talking about IP. You can see the comments because... Uh, it's on the right side. I know. You just have to wait for me to put it up on screen oh, oh, so before be, you read it. Okay, I'll do that. We're going to talk about eyepieces to start Magic. off the show today. Explore scientific eyepieces. Uh, we have a 70 degree not waterproof, but all of our other waterproof, all of our other eyepieces are waterproof. If the SKU is EPWP, eyepiece waterproof, WP waterproof. And they're highly engineered. We have this one right here. This is a uh, 82 degree 18, but we've cut it. Going to have to put it in, in front of the other eyepieces for half. the other shot. There you go. We've set cut it, it on the ground. There. We've cut it in half so you can see what's going on inside of it. There it is. Right there. Back there it up. It is. Just a touch. I'll pick it up and set it right here. Yeah, put is it where the 20 is. Move the 20. There you go. There we go. So you can see the insides, the guts of what's going on in here. So there's a couple of pieces of glass elements right here. Uh, lens here, lens here, and a multi-piece unit down here. Uh, this shows you what's going on inside of these uh, waterproof eyepieces, obviously. This one's not purged anymore because uh, we cut it in half. Uh, it's purged so of the purge. The purge has been removed. It's, so it's been, been purged. purged. Of the purge. Yep. As you can see, all the glass elements have edge blackening or they have a black housing up against them. These have been blackened on the edge with, a, I suppose it's a paint of some sort. Uh, what does that do? That uh, cuts down on the reflections that happen off those edges, which gives you better contrast inside. So if you, uh, you can see how these little pieces are wedged in there with screw-in pieces and, and uh, little pieces that screw in and screw in and get tight and you know a lot of people I've had people come and say you know I uh, I unscrewed my barrel because I wanted to see what was inside of it well it, it made a psh sound well it's because you ruined the eyepiece when you open it up and you took the purge now, out of it so we you didn't do have it. the ability you didn't ruin to fix the purge on certain products we do have a argon purge tank I don't know if we can purge eyepieces or not. I do not know. Uh, we can yeah, ask Rob that. Rob said, I, 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 I think Rob said we could, but yeah. each individual eyepiece or application will be different, so we can't guarantee that we can fix stuff. Yep. All we can do is say it's, it may, it may be work. possible. So 
This is what's inside of the eyepiece. It's a good visual. Hey, uh, Paul, I've got an antivirus protection expired and popped up over here, so I don't have a monitor anymore. Just go over there and kill it. I got it. Just walk off screen. Nothing like a dead screen to... Well, we're still talking. We're still here. Hello. How about this? Okay, there we go. We're out. We could show this. What is what this? Think? Well, that's the... Oh, the James Webb Space the, Telescope. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Ramesh Bahadri. Bahadri. Hey, Kent and Tim, I'm sorry about your name. I'll get it one of these days. Ramesh Oops. Bahadri. Bahadri. Thank you for joining us today. It. So, eyepieces. Let's jump in with it. eyepieces. Now, do they need an eyepiece for this stuff? Well, if you got a telescope, Paul... 50. You need an eyepiece. Not, well, no, for, for this one. The James no, Webb. No, there's no eyepiece. That's what I thought. And if you're up there, you'd have to hold your breath because you're in outer space. But. Uh, and you have to take your helmet off to be able to look through the eyepiece. not fun sometimes. Not being fun. I'm saying we could send you up there and you can hold your breath. Take your helmet off and look through the eyepiece and then uh, put your helmet back on. We haven't talked about that on this channel. Can't do that. What? Take your helmet off in space. Or open the visor for that matter. Thou shalt boil in a vacuum. So, what is going on? Why is my software responding? Oh, I know. All right, so eyepieces. That's so what I wanted to these, see. These are our 52 degree series eyepieces. You're not going to talk there about There are it? two Come on, sizes of eyepieces right we, here. That's like big news. We've You're not going to talk about the no, James? No, I'm, I'm going to talk about eyepieces. Eyepieces come in two sizes. I even gave you a segue. You don't need an eyepiece if you're the James Webb. It's true, but there's no eyepiece on the James Webb, so there you go. <sighs> so, eyepieces come in two sizes. Two-inch barrels, like right here in my right hand. So be on the, And the inch-and-a-quarter eyepiece right here in my left hand to notice the different diameters. So what that does is when you're buying eyepieces, you always have to make sure you get the ones with the correct barrel size. If you have a beginner telescope that has an inch and a quarter diagonal on it, you got to have inch and a quarter eyepieces. You can't use two inch eyepieces. But if you have a telescope that uses two inch eyepieces, like this can one, be adapted then, to two inch eyepieces. then you can put it, use an adapter to use inch and a quarter eyepieces. So if you have inch and a quarter and that's what your native size of your telescope is you can't go to two inch the telescopes you're going to look at today all have inch and a quarter they're all yeah. generally entry level and, and first or two steps up oftentimes only take inch and a quarter eyepieces but for math a that 100 math. degree eyepiece though There's, man that's way yeah, better but, yeah but that's not a first light type of eyepiece. I know. Nobody who's buying a beginner telescope is going to use a 120 degree or the 100 degree eyepiece. It's just, that's just not in the wheelhouse. They but might. you want to work your way up to that because boy, it's what very What if they nice. were given one? Uh, still probably don't have a telescope it'll work on because they're two inch eyepieces. That's true. Okay, so jumping in with both feet on eyepieces, we're going to math warning here. So there's two components for magnification. One component is the focal length of your telescope right here so you can't see it it's not on the screen the focal length of the telescope right right here the focal length of the telescope and the focal length of the eyepiece right here that's a 40 this is a 40 millimeter eyepiece all right so it's division not multiplication most people think the highest powered eyepiece is the one with the biggest number because highest number means bigger a lot of times but that's not how this works because it's division. So if this telescope has a focal length of 1,000, 40 will go into 1,000 how many times? 25. 4 will go into 100. I'm not here to do math. 4 will go into 100 2.5 times. Right? 2.5, carry the decimal, it's 2 to get up to 1,000 millimeters. So using the same 1,000 millimeter telescope, 
If we go down to a 20 millimeter eyepiece right here, the math is the same, 1,000 divided by 20. Well, it's division, so we're going to take, to do it in my head, I go 100 divided by 20 means 5, right? Carry the decimal, that's 50 to get us to 1,000. So we go from 25 to 50. Now if we go down to a 10 millimeter eyepiece, 2550 division, 10 will go into 100 10 times, so it'll go into 1,000 100 times. 2550 100, see we're doubling every time. When we cut the size of the focal length of the eyepiece in half, we double the magnification. 2550 100, if we go to a 5 millimeter, this is actually a 4.5 millimeter, but for our math purposes, we're going to say that it is, where did the number go? We're going to just, for math purposes, say it's 5, 25, 50, 100. Yep, I heard you say it, 200 power uh, eyepiece, or 200 power magnification. That changes with every telescope. Focal diameter, the diameter of the telescope doesn't come into the equation. It's all the focal length so of the, the telescope. So the 102 that I use. The DAR 102? 640 millimeters of focal no. length, if I remember correctly. Is it the one that I had this weekend? Yeah, it's DAR 102. It's the ED 102. Did you have the ED 102? Yes. Still, I think it's 640 millimeters of oh, focal length. Oh, I don't length. know, but it's got to get, just like you tell me, i got to get it right. I'm just asking. Get it right too. 600 millimeters of focal length. 640 millimeters of focal length, just like this telescope I have right next to me has. Right? The difference is one's a doublet and one's a triplet. One has two pieces of glass, and the one Paul used over the weekend has three pieces of glass up front. What does that third piece of glass do? Well, two pieces of glass create chromatic aberration. So when you look through the telescope, um, you start seeing the glass acts like a prism, breaking the light into its colors. And so you see red or blue, uh, depending on uh, how it's working. So you see red or blue fringing around bright objects. Well, uh, the third piece of glass negates that. It gets the light all lined up back happily uh, with its other uh, sibling colors. And so when you look through the eyepiece, you see very little microscopically amount to no chromatic aberration. So there you go. All right, so let's talk about the, t oh, one other thing first. You're going to buy eyepieces you want to buy something to take so care of them. Anthony, uh, this osmosis. osmosis. Yep. So the comments on YouTube, that's a, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about that. That's a YouTube problem. Or a restream problem. No, it's a YouTube problem. Yeah. So there's nothing we can do about it. Hmm. That's got to be fun to watch. So we sell an eyepiece carry case. Uh, it's a soft-sided carry case. If you're going to spend the money to upgrade your eyepieces, and the 52-degree eyepiece set is the uh, entry level of the least expensive of our waterproof eyepieces. They're least expensive, but they have the same engineering, the same designs. They're just smaller, um, but the same waterproofing, uh, the same everything goes into them. Oh, and waterproofing, didn't talk about that. Every eyepiece is, is submerged into a meter of water and left there for 30 minutes. And then the technicians pull them out, dry them off, and clean them and make sure the purge has not been lost. And since they pass that inspection, they get packaged up and shipped to us. But once you get an investment in eyepieces, you want to learn to take care of them. You don't just want to chunk them into a, tool, a, a, a box and carry them around. You want to protect them. And a great way to do it is using something like this eyepiece case right here. These eyepieces all fit in here. This has really good Velcro in it that, I can't say Velcro, it's hook and loop, that really yeah. hooks Velcro in. Velcro is a name brand, That's right. not a type. It's, it's not a, uh, a generic term. It's hook and loop is the generic term, and Velcro is one type of hook and loop. This right? is correct. So we should not use name brands in a generic way, like Coke, when you're talking about a carbonated caffeinated beverage or stuff that's brought in from uh, you know other 
Oh, countries. other jurisdictions to the south. Yes. Yes. Okay, so <laughs> you have a uh, double zipper, great little way to protect your investments right here. They will fit any eyepieces. You can shape them, uh, configure the uh, compartments to fit whatever you have, and uh, any eyepieces will work. If you don't have Explore Scientific eyepieces, have something else, that's not a problem. You can go ahead and buy this and put your eyepieces in it. Nothing says you can't do that. You're so, going to try to do the uh, ice cream thing again? The Dairy Queen thing? What Dairy Queen thing? Shove everything in there and try to knock them out. Oh, yeah. You want me to? Okay. That's what you usually do. We're going to try and do the blizzard test. If you ever go to Dairy Queen, they make you a blizzard and they hold the cup upside down to see if it's going to fall out. So let's see if I can make this all stay together and not fall out. I know one of them is going to. One always does. It's going to be that one right there. We'll put that well, just one fix there. it. It's you can, so here it's we movable. go. It's here movable. Go. Fix it, Kent. Nah. Here we go. Yep, it's going to fall See, out. So fix it. I'm going to fix it. Show you how easy this is to fix. I'm just going to pull the hook and loop off. I'm going to take the eyepiece out to do this. Pull the hook yeah, and loop off. Because it's pretty sturdy stuff. This is this is really grabby, sticky stuff. And make that a wee bit smaller. Make it a wee bit smaller. That probably, yeah, that's going to do it. So here we go. The Dairy Queen Blizzard test. Ah, it See? still fell out. It did fall. It did fell out. So what does that mean, Paul? Fix it. Fix it. I think that may do it. Here we go. One more time. The Dairy Queen Blizzard test. Ta-da! Yeah, the Dairy Queens, they don't hold them upside down that long. They just they go, look, they flip look. it over and say, see, it didn't fall out. Yep. But there we go. The eyepieces in the eyepiece case. So. Oh, my goodness. A piece of one of these yep. fell out. It'll be fine. Yeah, I don't know which one goes in, which way it goes in. These were glued in. They have become deglued. This Scott knows. He can See, fix it. See, this one goes in here like this. There, that fits. Well, I need to take those back. Get we need your to hot glue gun. Yeah, we need to go get the box guy to, to hot glue gun it back together. So I'll Give put these back over here. Give me a secret about eyepieces. Sir? I want a secret about eyepieces. You want a secret about eyepieces? I tell us a secret. I don't have any secrets about eyepieces. Uh, There's got to be a secret. Don't go crazy cleaning them, but, you know, you get eyelash stuff on the piece uh, of glass you look through. Uh, sooner or later, you're going to have to clean them, get the eye, eye, that eyelash and eyebrow grease oh, off. Oh, I and, have a uh, decent so video very, about that now. Very careful cleaning those. Did you what, know Paul? that, Ken? I got a say? video we can watch about eyepieces now. Ooh, yeah. It's how to clean your our waterproof eyepieces. Uh, let's see. 24. So. I, a better one than the other one that we've been using. If I can get it to call up. My Windows so. machine is not very responsive. Because well, it's a Windows machine. Well. But that's the whole other story. All right. So while he's getting that queued up. I can't help we're it. We're going to talk about. The first light series of telescopes, they come with a 25 millimeter super plossal. Right here it is. You know, an upgrade would be to the 52 degree eyepieces. And as you can tell, this is an inch and a quarter barrel because it's not two inches. And that's defined by the diagonal. Why is it called a diagonal? Light comes in from the telescope, bounces off the mirror, comes out at a diagonal. In this case, 90 degrees. So you can look down into the telescope instead of having to get down and look through it when you look up into the sky. So, so my, I'm going to put the diagonal my, back on. You got my it ready? buddy Devin is watching. He's local to Springdale. So good. Devin Brenstetter. Thank you, Devin, yeah. for uh, jumping in. What is that, Paul? I don't uh, know what he's talking about. What, but okay. what is that, Paul? That, Paul, is a large man who runs the computer system. That's what that is, Paul. What is that, Paul? I'm yes, not that, sure Paul. the vernacular is quite what he, what he means, that but sent to me, right, so, sentiment, so, but okay. This is a first light AR, meaning an acromat, meaning it has two pieces of glass up here in the front element. 
It has a six or an 80 millimeter diameter, so it's 80 millimeters in diameter. That's how much light, a measurement, how much light it's gathering in and squishing down to poke into your eye or dump into your eye. It has a focal length of 640 millimeters, right? And so knowing it has 640 millimeters, and this is a 25 millimeter plossal, a 25 millimeter eyepiece, we can do some math. 25 will go into 100 four times. 100 will go into 600 six times. So 6 times 4 is 24. The 25 will go into the extra 40 uh -oh. one time. So uh, what I say, 24, 25 and just a wee bit. So this has uh, 25 times magnification. If we switched it to a 12 and a half eyepiece, it's going to have, uh, what's it going to be, 26, I said, 25. Oh, it's easy. That's 50, right? 50 magnification. So you can do math fairly easily. It's not that hard to figure out this math. Just remember, it's focal length divided by the focal length of the eyepiece in millimeters, not in inches. Okay. Uh, I was asking about the thing uh, they were falling out before the telescope. Oh, those were eyepieces. Yes, those are eyepieces like this. Those are our, from our 52 degree series of waterproof eyepieces. So as long as they're waterproof, I have a video that explains how uh, to clean them. So you got it warmed up now? Oh, yeah. All right, here we go. And thank you for joining us in how to clean our waterproof eyepieces. How long is this, Paul? So as you're out there viewing the night sky, you're going to have... Uh, ton, a multiple variety of eyepieces, different brands uh, from different manufacturers, different eye reliefs, uh, different uh, field of views. Well, the great thing about these Explore Scientific waterproof eyepieces is that they are sealed with our Argon Purged. Um, they have a lifetime warranty, fully transferable, and uh, they are easy to clean and maintain. So today I'm going to use one of our 62 degree 40s. And we're literally going to dunk it into this water with some of our household items here. And we're going to clean these eyepieces. Now, again, I want to say, uh, if you have a non-waterproof eyepiece, uh, you do not want to try this. Basically, what will happen is water will get into those uh, eyepieces, get onto those optics, and you'll have to then take it apart or send it in for repair. So, again, waterproof eyepieces only. So, we're going to take just some degreaser here. And I'm just going to pour a couple drops into the water that we've got. Now, I'm going to take the eyepiece. I'm going to remove the eye relief uh, just to clean it separately. But uh, now I'm just going to take this eyepiece and kind of swoosh it around in the water. All right. Now that I've dunked it in a few times, I'm going to wipe off just that excess water on the outside. I'm then going to take some distilled water. I'm going to go ahead and spray it directly onto those optics. And with that distilled water, what that does is it helps uh, keep it to where there's no water spots drying onto those optics. So then we're going to take our pressured air, canned air. We're going to blow it off and then wipe it down. And I'm using a microfiber cloth here to wipe down the eyepiece. Just the outside. You can take some tissue paper or something nice and soft uh, for those optics. And that is it. That is our process on how to clean uh, Explore Scientific waterproof eyepieces. Literally something you can do in minutes um, with some household objects. So, uh, you know, give us a call or shoot us an email if you have any questions um, and keep looking up. Well, we're back. There we go. You saw Mike Hatch used to work here. Clean his, an eyepiece using what you just saw. Now, one thing I want to say caution is... He used is, distilled water, uh, some detergent. Uh, not any detergent. A, it wasn't. It's a knockoff Dawn, but you want to use unscented if you can or, you know, not anything crazy, but, you know, Dawn. Go ahead. Yeah. Isopropyl and, uh, alcohol. Canned air. And canned air. 
So the issue becomes canned air, be careful because when you shake the can, it's cold. You can make propellant come out, and that's going to get on your lens, and now you've got a bigger problem you got to deal with. So trying to shake your can, I sort of ribbed Mike about that. He knew it. He didn't, didn't realize you did it until after that video had been produced. But you also don't want to tip the can over either. You want to hold that still and press the button, let the air come out. Uh, Osmosis says, uh, oh, first light question. I have a 127 Mac with EQ3 nano mount. With some eyepieces to balance it, the single counterweight is all the way out on the bar. Do you sell additional half weights? Yes, we do have some. Um, you know, balance is not super critically important. We're you know, still it doesn't, it doesn't in have Facebook to be. land, so you can yeah, you can the website. you can contact us, uh, customer service. Go to our website. I don't believe they're listed on the website, so you're going to have to contact customer service. Uh, easiest way to do it, and it'll give you a link, is if you'll email service at explorescientific.com. That's service, S-E-R-V-I-C-E, -E, V as in Victor, service at explorescientific.com. And it'll give you an auto response that says, we don't use this email account, but please open a case at this link. Go to that link, open a case, and you'll be able to uh, uh, talk about what you need, and we can get you settled. Now. You know, as long as it's not way out of uh, kilter, uh, you're going to be fine. I, if it's close to being balanced, that's good enough. Uh, you're not doing high-end astrophotography probably with it. Uh, that's where balance becomes more critical. But don't get, you know, overly, overly wrapped up. You just don't want to unlock it and have it go whick and flip over. If it just sort of starts moving, you know, that's okay. But if it starts, you know, flipping, you know, really going over quick, that's when you need to be thinking about an extra counterweight. Now, don't do this either. Some people figure out that they can put a bolt in the end of the counterweight, take the, the safety nut or toe saver nut off, and put a piece of, go to their big box retailer, find a bolt that goes up in there. Yes, that creates a longer moment arm, more leverage, right? And so the same counterweight will work. However, because you're creating that moment arm, it's getting longer and longer. Instead of being a counterweight this long, it's now this long, and that creates a whip arm. And vibrations just go up and down and up and down, creating other problems for you. Uh, so don't do that. Now, this telescope, the First Light AR8640, 80, 80 millimeters in diameter, 640 millimeters in focal length, is on a twilight nano mount. This is a real simple, basic, straight up mount. It's just simply left, right, and up, and down. Very easy, very intuitive mount to master. You simply have to plunk it down on the ground, look up at what you want to do, and point the telescope at it. But there's a process that you have to go through. And right here is a red dot finder. This is it right here. It simply is a zero power. You look through it. It'll project a red dot right here on the little piece of glass or, or plastic uh, that's there. I've never actually tried to break it to see if it's glass or not, but I'm going to figure it's probably a piece of clear plastic. It slides in there. Now, some people just assume it just points in the same spot. That's not the case. So what you have to do is, uh, in the afternoon or evening, that makes it easier to see the red dot, right? Or if you're underneath a good old shade tree in the summertime and you want to look at something that's farthest away that you can see, uh, I think the manual says like 200 to 300 yards. That's about the minimum. Uh, you're going to get close with that. But if you can see something farther away, like a mile away or two miles, use that, right? But you want something that you can find and know you're getting it centered up in the eyepiece, like a radio tower or a stop sign or a tree with a unique you know, tree line and then a tall tree sticks up and it goes on. Well, you can get on the top of that tree. Put that thing into the center of your eyepiece by moving the telescope, turn on the red dot and simply start moving the red dot controls. You can move it left and right and up and down and you move those controls until you move that red dot onto the top of uh, cover up the object that you've got centered. Now once you get that done, look in the eyepiece again because you could have moved the telescope a little bit and you're really not lined up. So you want to move the telescope back and keep readjusting them until the red, what's in the center of the eyepiece, the red dot is on. Now you're ready to go out to look at something in the evening. So you go out and you want to look at a star, let's say, uh, oh gee, let's say Arcturus, or Arcturus is gone, I think. Let's say Regulus and Leo, 
and it's a bright star or you want to look at a, uh, any bright star, you simply, instead of looking through the telescope this time, you look through the red dot finder and you move the telescope up and down, left and right until the red dot is on top of, we'll say, that bright star. Now look in the eyepiece. If you've done a good job, really good job, the star is going to be centered up. But probably you're going to have to move the telescope just a little bit left, right, or up or down to get it centered. Now all you do is, very carefully, move the red dot. You're going to fine tune things, right? So you're going to fine tune the red dot. Look in the eyepiece because whatever star you're looking at, unless you're looking at Polar Polaris and it's a, you know, not a bright star, you're going to, it's going to be moving. And so you're going to move it again, get it centered up. Once the two things are centered up, now you fine tune the red dot. Now go to something else, right? And look at something else. Boop, there we go. We're on it. Red dot's on it. Look in the eyepiece. There it is, centered up. Now you can find things in the sky and go from there. All right, got a question coming in, uh, probably from Osmosis 007. I can see it. There it comes. Okay, thanks. It isn't much out of balance, just a slow return when balancing. And yes, visual viewing. Yeah, if it's a slow return when balancing, you're good enough. Uh, the trick is um, when you're balancing to balance it the same way every time, since you have the counterweight all the way down, you're simply ensuring that it's a little bit telescope heavy, which is what I advocate. Why? Because that always keeps the gear train uh, teeth engaged, right? Okay, so we're going to have to sign off for uh, just a second. We're going to go to a patch over to uh, the uh, Amazon live broadcast that we segue into. Uh, I'll be talking about the carousel. If you're on social media, you won't see it, but if you go over to Amazon Live and find us, you'll see it. And we would appreciate it if you did that. Go to AmazonLive.com and find us over there and click that follow button. That raises our algorithm. Uh, response up. So back in just a minute, folks. Thanks for joining us. See you in a few. I guess I'm on. I didn't yeah, see a cue. Yeah, I had my hand up. Ah, I didn't, said three, didn't, two, didn't, didn't hear you say anything one. to make me look at you. I was worried about the eyepieces getting straightened up. Hi, everybody. Kent Martz here with Explorer <laughs> Scientific. I just staring at the camera going, uh, I think I'm up on the monitor. Does that mean? Yes, it does. Hello? Today, is there anyone on here? Today is Wednesday here on Amazon Live. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we uh, are going to be talking about First Light Chronicles today. Uh, first Light named after the First Light series of telescopes, but it also talks about, um, you know, first, your questions. first Light is, uh, when you buy a new telescope and you look through it, that's called First Light of the telescope, uh, and that's a milestone in people who have started amateur astronomy or have been doing it and get a new scope. We're also here to answer your questions about Astronomy, amateur astronomy, astrophotography, uh, birds, fishing rods, whatever. We'll, we'll tackle whatever question you have. If I have some expertise and if I don't, uh, and I just have a little bit of knowledge, I'll fall back on that. And if I don't, I'll fake it. No, I'll tell you when I don't know what the answer is. So we're going to start talking about eyepieces. Explore Scientific has a, uh, a variety of eyepieces that are waterproof. They are 52 degree, 62 degree, 68 degree, 82 degree, 92 degree, 100 degree, and a 120 degree flagship eyepiece. Those are all waterproof. I've got an example of one right here. This is an 82 degree 18 that has been cut in half and 
one of the elements has come deglued, so I'm going to have to go get that glued on there. Uh, you can see inside what's going on inside of an eyepiece. There's various pieces of glass. This is a couple of pieces of glass right here. They're sandwiched together and I probably glued. I haven't taken it out. Uh, standard standalone pieces of glass. Another piece, a couple of glass elements right here. Some really high math goes into these to make these things work. Uh, and you can see how these are held in here by little screw-in pieces. These are all screw-in, and then that element goes in, a piece gets screwed in, that piece of glass goes in, another little piece gets screwed in, more glass, another piece, more pieces, and that's how this thing gets put together is, can we get a, a shot of that, Paul? There we go. I forgot to get it down there in the on camera, too. There we go. You can see it right there, how all those little pieces Put together, this is not just a steel tube with glass stacked up and a little couple of spacers. There's a lot of math and engineering goes in designing how these things go together and how these pieces of glass work together to give you a nice, sharp, crisp, uh, high contrast image. One thing that helps the high contrast is the edges are blackened with, uh, a, I assume it's paint. What does that do? Edge blackening ensures that uh, it, it eliminates reflections of light that can come off the edges because a edge of glass can be a very good mirror. By blackening it, it eliminates that uh, uh, reflection. So those lack of reflections mean you have a higher contrast image in your eyepiece. So you can see that right there. This is a cutaway version. These are purged with um, argon. So as they're, when they're assembled, they're put into an argon tank, a tank full of argon, and uh, that then forces all the air out of it. And since argon <coughs> is an inert dry gas, it will not hold moisture, that dry gas forces out all the moisture. And now when they seal it up and put it together, it is now a waterproof and airtight, meaning Air can't get into it, and if air can't get in, there's no moisture, it's not going to fog up internally, right? So you're not going to be at the eyepiece and it gets fog inside, which you're done for a long time, and which the eyepiece you know, may never get the fog out of it again. You don't face that here. At the factory, I am told, not seen it, but Scott uh, describes it, they literally put all the eyepieces in a big tank of water after they've been purged uh, one meter deep, leave it in there for at least 30 minutes, then pull them out, dry them off, clean them up, and make sure they have not leaked. And if they haven't, they get packed up and shipped to the United States where we send them out to our great customers. So if you're joining us here on Amazon Live right now, thank you very much. Uh, we try hard to uh, do a lot of education here. Yes, we're selling products and promoting our products. We're also promoting amateur astronomy as a whole and really encourage people to uh, uh, ask questions, and you're going to see Paul walk through. Say hi. I do now. Say hi, Paul. That's how Paul says hi. He sighs and walks off. He's over there working on getting the monitor. There he is. Yep, just like that. There he is. What can I say? All right. So this is the 52 degree series of eyepieces. That 52 refers to the apparent uh, field of view when you look through the eyepiece. So when you look through this eyepiece, and if you measured the field of view, it's going to be 52 degrees, okay? When you go to a telescope, that gets restricted down. But the bigger the field of apparent field of view, the bigger the true field of view. There's some math in there. I'm not going to talk to you about how that works because it's just not a first light sort of thing. It's not something you need to understand at this point. Uh, other than to say, the wider the field of view in the eyepiece, the, the wider the 50 degree series, the wider field of view you're going to get. The magnification is going to stay the same. You're just going to see a wider apparent or true field of view. Now then, just do this from over here. if you want to. I can't control anything. You, why not? Because I don't have any control over anything. It's all over there. Well, use brain waves. <laughs> brain waves. All right, so we're going to use some brain waves because math warning. We need to get a little thing that pops up that says math, math warning, math warning. Okay, a little bit of math here. 
so you can figure out what magnification your telescope's at. Now, people who start out in amateur astronomy, they automatically assume uh, they want to see everything at the highest magnification possible. And so what they do is they go to the biggest number on the eyepiece because it's the biggest number. That means the most magnification, right? Well, that would be wrong. That would start out at a 40, in, in the 52 degree series eyepiece, a 40 millimeter eyepiece. This one has the lowest power of all these eyepieces. There's also another difference you need to be aware of right here, okay? That difference is this. The eyepiece in my right hand has a two inch barrel. The eyepiece in my left hand has a 1.25, a one and a quarter inch barrel. So if your telescope only takes 1.25, one and a quarter inch eyepieces, you can't use a two, piece, two inch eyepiece. So when you're buying eyepieces, you need to always be careful to check and make sure the eyepiece diameter you're buying, because you don't want to spend the money on a two inch and it not fit. But if you have a telescope that uses two inch eyepieces, which are generally more expensive telescopes, you have a two inch eyepiece, you can put two one and a quarter inch eyepieces on them because there's an adapter that necks it down from two inches to inch and a quarter. So just a little tidbit, word of caution when you're buying eyepieces. Now, back to the math. All right, so. It takes a second to build new graphics. That's right, you can, you can get it up and we'll, be, we'll use it next time. All right, so warning, there's two components it. to how you calculate magnification. The focal length of the telescope which tells you how far it is from the glass elements in front to where all those right light rays converge into a single point where they're in perfect focus. That's called focal length. So for easy math, let's say your telescope has a 1,000 millimeter focal length, okay? So 40 will go into 1,000 how many times? Hmm, let's see. Well, we can make it simpler. 40 will go into 100 two and a half times, right? So that's two and a half. Well, you're moving, adding one zero, so you just move the decimal point and it becomes 25 power. So a 40 millimeter eyepiece on a telescope with 1,000 millimeters of focal length yields a power of 25. So if we go down to the 20 millimeter eyepiece, 20 will go into 105 times, move the decimal point to the right, and that's 50 power. So we've gone from a 40 millimeter eyepiece giving us 25 power to a 20 millimeter eyepiece, eyepiece giving us 50 power. Went from 25 to 50. Hmm, it's doubled exactly, right? It went from 40 to 20 and from 25 to 50. This is a 10 millimeter eyepiece. 10 will go into 100, 10 times. So it'll go into 1,000, move the decimal, 100 times. 25, 50, 100. This is a 4.5. We'll just call it a 5 for easy math here because <coughs> that half a millimeter for what we're doing doesn't really matter. So it goes 25, 50, 100. It's double twice as small, means double the magnification, meaning 200 power with this eyepiece in a telescope with 1,000 millimeters of focal length. So if you're joining us here on Amazon Live, we have a chat function up. We would love to hear from you. Uh, you can just click the chat button and ask a quick ask us a question, or you can just say hi to us, right? And uh, we love to see who's watching and give them a shout out back. And uh, if you uh, give us a follow, we most certainly will thank you for that. Uh, and we really appreciate people who share their time with us on our social media and Amazon Live broadcast. So this telescope next to me, math warning again, uh, this uh, telescope has a focal length of 640 millimeters, meaning from the two piece of the glass elements in the lens to where that point of light comes to focus is 640 millimeters. So we can't put the 40 in, but we can sure put the 20 in. 20 will go into 100 five times. 100 going to 600, six times, six times five is 30 and 20 will go into 42 times, so that's 32 power. The 20 millimeter eyepiece in the first light AR, 80 millimeter 640, will yield 32 power magnification. Now we know it doubles, right? So we go down to the 10, it's 32, that'd be 64. 
We can go down to the 5 millimeter, technically 4.5, but we're not going to worry about it. So it goes from 32 to 64 to. Mm, 66 Yes, 128. I heard y'all say that. 128 math. power. Sir? Math. Math. It's a thing. That's all the math we're going to talk about today. It's pretty simple and straightforward. Just remember the two components of focal length are. That's right. Focal, two, you know what I meant. The uh, two components of magnification, calculating magnification are focal length of the telescope and the focal length of the eyepiece. Focal length of the telescope divided slash by the focal length of the eyepiece will yield you the magnification of the telescope. Now here's an aside. If you have a microscope, a microscope is exactly opposite of a telescope. So to figure the, the, the uh, uh, magnification power of a microscope, you multiply the focal length of the telescope or the mi microscope by the power of the eyepiece, the millimeters of the eyepiece. That's how you figure magnification on, an, on a t uh, microscope. All right, so we have before us a way to protect your investment. After I pointed at the telescope, a way to protect your investment of your eyepieces. This is the uh, soft-sided carry case, uh, eyepiece case. Uh, it comes with a very strong hook, hook and loop panels, so you can customize your carry case into protecting all of your eyepieces very well. I do the shake it upside down Dairy Queen test. I can make these come out, but you can make these things stay in there real well. See, not going to fall out. I'm not squeezing on it. Oh, they fell out. But here we who, go. Who's ever going to do that, right? Okay, here comes the math warning logo or bug math one you make it flash and have little there we you know, go little star things that pop out You're in the back not. yeah the problem is when we're live like this i can't oh test i know it. that i'm, I'm surprised you I have, have to done test it live I, that's nothing yeah. dude every every day we test things live paul and right know. here on the show so we're going to spin away from eyepieces talk about this telescope over here this is a great starter telescope. It's over in the carousel right now. It's not expensive. And folks, I'll tell you, the difference between a toy slash educational telescope and a, a full-blown amateur astronomer telescope is very little money. Uh, this is a full-blown amateur astronomer telescope. It's ready to go. This telescope, we'll talk about the mount first. This telescope tripod will go higher. We have it set like this so it presents very well here in the studio. It's a simple tripod. It moves left, right, just like you can see, and it moves up and down so you can point in the sky and move it around. So over here is the working part of the telescope for our eye. Your eye goes right in that eyepiece. Now, this telescope comes with a 25 millimeter super plossal eyepiece. Uh, a lot of times the go. first things, math warning, yeah. math warning. Hang on. Darn thing. Okay, so you're going to get an eyepiece. After a certain point, you're going to want to start doing some upgrades. My thoughts are upgrade to better eyepieces right. makes the telescope better. Just like good tires makes a car better, um, the eyepieces make a good telescope better. All right, here we go. It's going to be annoying, but I'm going to do it. Ready? Oh, he's got sound with it. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes. Okay, so story about that sound. That's the uh, sound basically of a radiation alarm. And I was at John Brown University for the it is dedication. Not a radiation alarm. It's close enough. Uh, for the dedication of the construction management, build, management building where they do have some uh, nuclear material, some, some material to do testing with and talk about, you know, radiation and things like that. And we're sitting there and right in the middle of uh, the president's speech. You start hearing that radiation alarm go off. And I look up and I look at the fire chief and he looks at me and the police chief looks at us and we look at each other and we start to say everybody get out of the building because I, I knew what it was. And nobody else was looking around. And then you hear somebody goes, hey, hey, I'm at a meeting, I'll call you back. And it was somebody's phone, their ring was that alarm. <laughs> and boy, it was 
Folks, I'm going to tell you, for me, it was a high pucker value moment right then and there. Because if there's a radiation alarm going off, it's not good. And I'm thinking, boy, you really shouldn't have a radiation alarm. And, you know, it turns out there's a couple other people that I didn't see later on. You know, they saw me straighten up. Loud. Huh? I think it may be too loud. But boy, it was awesome later on to tell that story. So anyway, back to the job at hand, talking about this telescope. This is the first light, AR, meaning achromat. I've got a question coming in. It's an achromat, meaning it's going to have some chromatic aberration. What's chromatic aberration? Um, is the eye relief constant on the 52 degree series? Uh, osmosis 007 asks. No, it's not. Eyepieces are going to change. Uh, because there's so much going on, the eye relief changes a little bit with each eyepiece, although it's not vastly dramatic. And I cannot tell you what the eye relief is on each of our eyepieces. Uh, it's not something I've committed to memory. I probably should at some point, but I have not done that. There's also math warning, uh, math involved uh, in figuring out what eye relief is. Uh, I may do a show just on uh, math, the, eye, the math of... Uh, astronomy, uh, which includes figuring out eye relief and things like that. For those you know of you who don't know, to do that? what, Paul? You know how hard it is to do that I know, because we've got to make graphics for everything. Yep. Well, no. I have to manually make it flash. Oh, I know. Oh, you have to manually make it flash? Yeah. Well, figure out how to automate it. There's got to be a way, Paul. There's no way you have to click on and off to make it flash. I can't get the sound to go. Oh, boy. You're going to have to rise to the challenge over the next week, man. All right, so anyway, so eye relief is how far away so you can annoying. get with your uh, eye and it still be in focus. That's called eye relief. So some some you have to be right up on top of, and some have really generous eye relief. You can be, you know, 10, 15 millimeters away, maybe more sometimes. So this telescope is an acrobat. We were talking about that when the question came in. That means there's going to be chromatic aberration. What is that? You've got two pieces of glass that start acting like a prism, and it starts breaking the light up into a rainbow. So when you look at bright objects, you're going to see generally red or blue, uh, which is the, the very ends of the visible light in the rainbow, right? Okay, so uh, that's just inherent with uh, doublets, telescopes with two elements up front. It's inherent chromatic aberration. You can minimize it with some coatings and spacing, but they're all going to have it. If you upgrade to a triplet telescope, one with three pieces of glass up front, that third piece of glass gets the light to line up with all its cousin colors, so it gets back into the it has cousins. white. Yes, the first cousins, you know, because it goes to red to orange, they're first cousins. Yellow is the second cousin to red. I don't know if they're on actually on, related. On. Uh, they, well, know. yeah, they are because they all came from the same photons and get broken up into their colors. They're cousins, my friend. Anyway, it gets them all lined up back into white. So in a triplet, which is called an apochromat, APO. Yeah, but means, they can't get married, so how could they be cousins? No, they, they are married until the prism causes them to divorce, and then they get back together. It's, uh, it's legal in most states to marry your first cousins, Paul. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. No, it's not. Like 24 states. That's not most. Many That's states. like your brother's kid. No, it's like your mother's your uncle's sister's kid. kid. Yeah, your uncle's kid. Yeah. That's not good. Don't do that. Why? Genetics? Sometimes, forearm. sometimes, you know, hey, I've got double cousins multiple ways. You are from Arkansas. When it was... Uh, you know, really isolated. There weren't a lot of girls available, or boys for that matter. Oh, wow. It's, well, it's you true. went there. It's Good true. Grief. It's true. You know, when, <laughs> when it's a day's ride to the first, to the closest, biggest, you know, little, biggest little city, you know, it's a wagon ride of 14 miles one way. No. People, you went to, you went from so, Gailey Hollow to, to Solemn Springs once a month. You're the one that got us off track this time. I did not. I was just making silly humor about light. Dude, you know, hey, genetics pops up all the time when we're talking about, you know, if you want to do, uh, do a weird punt chart, that's how you I do genetics. I know what I want to talk about. I had a choc two chocolate labs we bred, 42 chocolate puppies. Effectively impossible, but it still happened because the impossible can't happen. 
All righty then. No. I know what I want to talk about. Math warnings? No. What? Say something that I think. Uh, 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 that I think we need to talk about if we're going to, you know, there's oh. elephants in the room. I, sir, am not an elephant. You are in the room, however. You're the only person, so and there isn't down to you. Wow. Thanks. You're the yes. one that started brought up elephants in the I room. I didn't say you were an elephant. Uh, three Nando three. When will the sun end? About five billion years from now. Yeah. Uh, what's going to happen is it's going to stop. It's going to run out of hydrogen to fuse, and it'll start fusing helium into golly, I can't remember. Been too long. And when it starts fusing, stops fusing hydrogen and starts fusing helium, the Earth, the the sun will puff up because it will get hotter and that will puff up the surface of the sun to outside the orbit of Mars, which means we won't be around until it's, we won't be around because the Earth will be gone. Uh, and then what's going to happen is it's going to go through its life cycle and it doesn't have enough mass to go supernova, so it's going to blow off its outer shell and become a planetary nebula of some sort and the uh, what's left will cool off into a white dwarf. Nando what happens says, if it accidentally it, implodes and turns it, into a black hole? It can't. It doesn't have enough mass. Well, uh, is this a accident. science show or a breeder show? Well, science and breeding are the same thing. So No. Uh, OMG and LMAFO, yes, Nando, we have a good time on this show. And if you have a question about astronomy or heck, genetics, I'll take a stab at it. Look, I, here's you know. the, the latest governmental release is that, of space. Is that the latest, latest, like new, not James West original? That's the James, James Webb. West. It's, it's James the Webb, first, I said West. first one. This is the, this is the James the, Webb. James Webb. This is a section of that first star. You, you know, you're staring at. And by this time, most people that are interested have probably heard this. You're staring yeah. at a spot in the sky that was black, that's the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length, yeah. and in that angular distance, there are thousands of galaxies. Basically, if it's a point of light that does not have the uh, spikes coming off of it, it's especially in that deep gap. That background, um, um, wow. it's a galaxy. Yeah, it's a Pretty galaxy. Yellow. Each one of those oh, is a galaxy. Now we switched over to uh, a nebula, where you're looking at star formation, little planetismals. There it is. You know, uh, just fantastic. You know, and then you know you don't really get the the uh, effect of this until you put it next to a, a uh, um, Hubble telescope image that's in there. Uh, so, um, I could do that too. How does the James Webb Space Telescope work? Well, it's real straightforward. It, it sees in the infrared, the far infrared, and therefore those wavelengths of light are not blocked by the interstellar dust. Turns out inter interstellar dust is effectively the same diameter as the wavelength of visible light. So it blocks out all visible light. So you have to go outside of the visible to see it. Those really long red wavelengths uh, go right through it. That's what allows us to see uh, things that are in a part of the visible black sky. Nando, if you can mate with your cousins, why can't you marry boys? So marrying and mating are two different things. Um, so anyway, moving anyway. on. Hey, it is what it is. Uh, so, so this top yeah. is Hubble, bottom is James Webb. Yep. And now you see the difference in what it can see. You know that interstellar dust down in the nebula. Um, you can see. Uh, you know a part, a place in the, in the Hubble that you can't see through, but yet you can see right through it in the James West because it sees right through all that dust. Hey, Amazon customer started following. Thank you very much, Amazon customer. We appreciate that follow. Uh, we we uh, appreciate you blessing us with your time 
uh, as is Nando as well. Thank you very much. Back to the telescope, because what this show is about is first light. People who are interested in getting in astronomy don't know where to start. Uh, one good place is the first light AR, 80 millimeter, 80 millimeters in diameter, describes how big the hole is and light goes in. 640 millimeter telescope uh, comes with everything you need to get started. Eyepiece, the diagonal, the focusers are installed, the red dot finder, the tripod. The tripod is dead simple to use. You plunk it down to the ground, you move it left, right, up, and down to find your target. Now, to find your target easier, it comes with a red dot finder. I'm going to remove it so you can see it a little better. Here it is. It's a zero power device. And when you look through it when it's turned on, it just projects a little red dot right there on the screen. And using this knob and this knob, uh, actually this knob and this knob, you can move that red dot left and right and up and down, okay? So when you put the red dot finder on, it is not aligned with where the telescope's looking at. It's just roughly in the neighborhood. So what you do is you find something, the farther away the better. The direction, say, two or 300 yards, that's a start. Anything closer is not going to work real well. You want to get farther away. If you can get a mile away or five miles away, that's better than 300 yards. But 300 yards will get you there. 300 meters, if you're in the rest of the world that uses meters, 300 meters will work just fine to get you a good rough start. Uh, so, so yeah. what's the difference between the telescope you have and the telescope that they use, they, and the difference between the James Webb? Uh, $20 billion. Oh, my God. Oh, you asked? I didn't ask you to, for a... It's, it's got a 12-foot mirror or something like that that's in segments. Answer that's in segments that was folded and unfolded um, and it is cooled to uh, near zero. It has a sunshade on it that blocks the sun that lets the telescope cool off to yes, uh, what's near... What's the difference between the telescope you've got and the telescope... Well, I'm working my way to it and because it's now seen basically in heat, right, in the infrared, um, now because it's so cold, the sensor is sensitive to, to heat and you're basically taking a picture of heat is what it amounts to. In a telescope, when you look through it, you're looking through it at light, visible light. That's the difference. One is a small visible light telescope, the other one is a behemoth uh, heat sensor, right? Light is heat, but it's visible light. You get in the infrared, you start getting into measuring you know, with heat is what it amounts to. Okay. Uh, Nardo, laugh out loud. I love this, man. We try not to be a comedy hour, but it sometimes turns into one. So, or an argumentative uh, hour. An argumentative hour. I, hey, I, it's not arguing. It's discussions. See, but see, for people who think, there are people who think discussions like you and I have are arguments. They want to argue. I don't see it as arguments. It's discussion. It's a fun discussion. It's banter back and forth. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to bring to set a rubber chicken. I'll bring one tomorrow. And I'll start throwing it at you. I'll bring it and squeak it at you. Ugh. If I squeak it and throw it on the floor, will you run over and grab it in your mouth and, and bark at it? That'd be fun to see. How much money you got? Not, not, uh, I'll give you $5 to do it. Nope. Yeah, there we go. All right, so back to the so, telescope. But no, we, it, it's the edge. I know you want to continue with the sales what, portion of it. No, it's the education portion of it. But that's what I'm trying to get you to segue into. But Kent doesn't know improv rules, so I, I, I'm I have to hard. tell him what I want. I'm trying very hard <laughs> to explain how to align the red dot finder. Yes, but before you started on that, I was talking about these telescopes. And what the difference is, why? So can you see something like this no. from a telescope? No. And why? Because it doesn't have enough magnification power, and it doesn't see an infrared, and your eye is not a camera. Uh, that first exposure, first picture we looked at uh, was 11 and a half hours of staring at the same spot, of building up data, and I'm sure they stack it. Your eye and your brain does not stack up information. Your eye sees light in real time, right? And doesn't build it up. If, you're, if you take a camera and take a picture 
through the telescope that you're looking through for 30 seconds, you're going to see vastly more than you can see, ever see with your eye because the camera builds up data. The camera sensor allows you to build up data. And if you take 20 30 second exposures and stack them up, then you're now adding massive amount of data to it and you're getting colors and things like that and you never, your eye doesn't do that. It's like, a, pop up that picture of Jupiter real quick, Paul. I'm, I haven't even got it yet. I know, but are you going to Jupiter? I'm trying. So when you see these beautiful pictures, when you see these beautiful pictures of like <laughs> Ju of Jupiter or Saturn, those are often thousands of images taken by, the, by a video camera shooting at one thirtieth of a second. And they'll stack up thousands of those frames and then manipulate them to bring out the details. Your eye can't do that. Uh, when you look through a telescope at something that you see a beautiful color picture of, you're not going to see it ever look like That's that. That's not necessarily true. It's necessarily true. No, because although it was very tiny, and you, I was because I was using a uh, one of our extreme entry level telescopes, um, I I could see the red the red in the the spot. Sure. On Jupiter. Right. So, but it's not going to look like the highly manipulated photos you see that people go, wow, about. Well, I'm You're trying to see find it. the least photo. Sure, there's people out there who manipulate you know? uh, things for what they look like, but they never look, you don't see those bright, you don't see a bright red, red spot. But if you see a picture with a bright red, red spot on Jupiter, it's manipulated. It doesn't look like that. Can you see that it's red or brown? Yes. Is it those bright colors? No, never will be. I, never will be, Paul. Never will be bright colors. Can't. Well, not bright. Well, maybe. I mean, can't. Like when you look at the M42, the Great Nebula in Orion, Orion Nebula, Orion's Nebula. When you look at it in pictures, you see all sorts of reds and blues. When you look at it with your eyeball, green, gray, green, green, gray. Yeah, that's Nebula, though. Well, but. It, but that's generally one of the first things people look at with a telescope, is that. First thing no, I looked at was uh, Nando 3, knowing all this information, do you believe in God? Um, I'm going to answer that question. Uh, it's not what a religious you, question per se. Uh, do I believe in a divine creator? Yes. Do I? Uh, I'll just leave it at that. I, I, I believe it's that science. It's not really a topic. For not that. a topic, but I'm going to touch it real quick. I believe that science and religion are the same thing, trying to explain the same thing. Leave it at that, okay? Okay. So this picture. Mm-hmm. Unless you have a very, It might very, be from, like, this is from NASA. So this is uh, planets. This, this, go ahead. Go back and read the, the there's people. Here. There's people who can take pictures like that with... Maxitov casting grains and, and good refractors, yeah. and they'll shoot five minutes of video at 30 frames a second, and then stack up the best 30 percent, and then manipulate them, and they can produce images that look like that. Now this is a NASA photo, okay? Uh, I've lost it. I've lost the description. Where the heck did it go? So anyway, but you're never going to see it look like that in, in this telescope. You're not, not going to do that it. Telescope, no. You're, you're not going to see that ever look like that in any telescope That's because unsure. it's not a single exposure. It'll never look that sharp. The clouds, the scene, the what makes stars twinkle is difference in temperatures, right, of the Earth's atmosphere. There it is. And they will, photographers take videos of it, and then they tell the computer to pick out the ones that are in focus. So when it's bad scene and, the, and the, it's, it's the atmosphere is making the planet surface move around, it throws it out. But for a moment or two, it may be real steady, and it pulls those out, right? And you can see that in the eyepiece looking at Jupiter or Saturn. You'll be looking in there, and it'll look sort of wavy and fuzzy, and all of a sudden it'll get sharp and crisp for just a two seconds or maybe three if you're lucky, and it goes back jumbled up again, and then it'll give you a moment where it jumps into sharp, crisp focus yeah. because 
all the air going past is the same density, and so it quits refracting the, the light, and then it goes back to a different density, and off you go. Um, the cat from outer space started following. Well, thank you, cat Ooh. from outer Ooh. space. We so appreciate that very much. I can't use the cat anymore. You guys put the kibosh on me using the cat. I've got a cat. Oh, pop the cat up. Since we have somebody talking about the cat from outer space, well, pop the cat up. This will be fun. This will be fun. This is a NASA photograph. So this is probably taken by a space telescope or a giant telescope, which may only be a single exposure because it's probably 40 feet long. It all depends on the, on the sensor, sensor saturation. You can only expose yeah. until the... The pixels start getting filled up, and you got to stop because you stop but capturing I could say data. That when I looked at Jupiter, it was really small because I had an Explorer One something. I while I couldn't see this kind of detail, I could see the spot, and it was very similar to this for me. Uh, for in me, a, in a low power image, I, that's brighter than I've ever seen it. Generally, in a small telescope, you're going to see those two bands. And it'll look like a marble with two bands on it, two dark bands, brown bands. And that's what you'll see. Have I seen Jupiter so where you can see the festooning like that? Yes. One time we were, and I've talked about this before, we were at the Winter Star Party probably in 2000 uh, down in the Florida Keys. It was a, a night where it was perfectly clear. There was a little wind blowing coming off the ocean, and it had what's called laminar flow. All the air was the same density, and it was really, really clear. Think about dead winter when you walk out and you see the, sky, the stars and they don't twinkle. They just look like a bright spot set in there. The air was like that, except it was in February down in the Keys. And um, we had a 14-inch Celestron that we started putting two and three power Barlows on. And I don't know, we were at, at you know... 1500 power, some crazy, crazy long focal length. Jupiter was big and round in the eyepiece and absolutely steady. And you could see those little curly cues and festooning and things like that. Sadly, Saturn wasn't up, so we couldn't look at it too, but it would have looked fantastic. It would have looked something like that without those bright colorations because this is, uh, if I remember correctly, that image is probably a uh, infrared image and not a white light image. That's where that greens and blues down in the, uh, what would that it be? It could the just be chromatic aberration. Northern well. No, no, it's going to be uh, an infrared. If that's from NASA, that's an infrared image. That's, that's in multiple spectra. I don't know about this one. Multiple spectra anyway. I like this planet better. Whenever I like, I'm, what, when you I'm know looking. What my favorite planet is, Paul? What? Earth. When I'm looking, it was a straightforward question. It, this, I'm not. I'm just, is it the one where? Me, is it you the one where? You make me want to ignore you. Is it? Is it? Oh, if only that would happen. Is it the one where uh, Earth is in the background? What? The picture from Saturn where you see, can see Earth as Nobody's a couple of pixels. It's never. It's never existed. What has never existed? See Earth in a picture of Saturn. Sure. Absolutely. You can make it. But no. The Cassini, the Cassini probe, I think it was Cassini, oh, yeah, was on the back it. side of the planet looking back towards the sun, and you could see the Earth in the picture. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like when Voyager, one of the Voyagers, took a, turned around and took a farewell image of, you could see all the planets lined up, including Earth out there. It took a massive effort to do it, but, boy, it's a cool picture. So, All right, so one of the things that our CFO wants us to do is to make sure that we set up expectations for what you're going to actually get when you get a telescope. Well, I'm, I still haven't explained how to get the red dot finder line, Paul. Oh my gosh, Kent. The people want to buy a telescope. I, and I want them to buy a telescope and have it work. Then we've done it so many times. Uh, the cat from outer space, how did you feel? Yeah, but the cat's not ever seen it before, and neither is Nando 3. It's going to be my bet. Uh, cat from outer space, did you pop the cat up for everybody to see? I, I haven't had time. Now, did you, how did you feel when Mariner revealed a desolate surface on Mars with no signs of life? Um, Mariner 
revealed a desk, desolate surface on Mars with no signs of uh, humanoid life, no structures, no canals and things like that. I, I wasn't alive then, but it doesn't surprise me a lick that that's what it found because we know Mars is a probably currently a dead planet, uh, but maybe not. But um, the probes there today are looking for signs of past life. And more and more things are pointing towards the environment was very conducive for life. Do I think they're going to find signs of past life? I think it's better than 50-50. I think there's a better chance they find and ultimately prove uh, life once existed than not. Um, here's the cool part. It would take humans multiple days to prove or disprove it if we were there because of the limited abilities of the rovers. Uh, they don't have the cognitive ability of a human to walk up, crack open a rock and say, right there, that's a fossil, right? Uh, or go to the right spot. So there's a lot of, uh, do I think we should go to Mars? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot to be learned. Uh, would I go on a one-way trip to Mars? If my family was cool with it, I'd do it. Um, you know, um, now, think about, hang on a second, Paul. Think about uh, Magellan when he set off to go around the world. Chances are those guys are never coming back. Uh, there's cases of people sailing off into the world and never returning. Columbus could have just, just as easily been drowned, capsized in a hurricane and never came back. Uh, taking risk is part of exploration. You know, all the astronauts that ever flew on the space shuttle knew the risks, and they took those risks anyway for the thrill of doing something different. You know, and uh, the astronauts who died, they went up willingly knowing the chances of something bad happening were pretty good in the long term. And it's just the reality of anything. We take it for granted when we get in our cars and drive to the grocery store. But, you know, a vast percentage of wrecks happen within like 10 miles of your house. Uh, fatal wrecks. And so, you know, it's, it's a risk analysis. Am I willing to get my car to risk my life? We don't think about it now, but that's what you do every time. Uh, so, Paul, go ahead. This seems like a fake picture. That is a picture, picture uh, that I'm going to say is probably fake. Uh, what's the source? Do you know? It doesn't say. The stars just don't look right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's fake. Let's see the rings. Look, get pictures of NASA. Well, we could, we could, it, it may not even be Saturn. It may be a fake. You could get up another... The source is CNN, so it's definitely fake. Ha. Uh, <laughs> that's just wrong. Alderaan. Huh? Alderaan. What's Alder? Alderaan. The planet in uh, Star Wars. Oh, is yeah. it? Okay. It so doesn't it, exist it, anymore. They blew it up. It, do, it looks fake because the stars don't look right and the, the rings don't look like Saturn's rings. I just think that particular Mars mission was a turning point because most people believe they would at least find vegetation. Um, yeah, I mean, I can see. I, I think there were. There's no atmosphere on Mars. That's the problem. Uh, there is an atmosphere. It's not tenuous, yeah. and and the solar wind it doesn't have a, a live magnetic magnetic field, and yeah. so um, it's easy for the solar wind to simply blow the atmosphere away. So it's like one percent. It has an atmosphere because that's how that little helicopter thingamajig can't remember the name of it, uh, flu. It's because there is enough air, enough atmosphere there to uh, actually fly a um, mini helicopter. This one um, seems real, but it might be a stacked image. Well, all the images you see of Saturn are stacked. If they, unless they just... You that's, know what? I don't think it's real. Look at the shadow. Look at the stars. No, the shadow yeah. would look like that. But look at the stars. You, you can't expose to the brightness of the planet yeah. and then get the stars. 
So it's going to be this it, one is it's it's, this, it's a composite image would be my guess. Planet Saturn against a dark starry sky. Uh huh. Elements of this image furnished by NASA. Yeah, so it's a composite. It's yes. it's not a it's it's a it's a composite where they took two different completely yeah. different pictures and merged them and that together. That shadow's fake. No, I don't think so. That's, it's really sharp. It, it is sharp because there's. I mean, that's what it looks like. You can find other pictures of Saturn that look like that. I Saturn's really cool. Any. It goes through a phase where, based on where it is in the orbit, it its rings tip like that, and there's a point in its orbit that it reaches where the rings actually disappear edge on as viewed from Earth. You literally can't see it, and then it goes through this cycle where it opens up again, reaches the extreme, and goes back. It's now closing. Uh, down and eventually it's going to reach that point. I don't remember the, the time scale, but it's over 18 years, something like that. It goes through that cycle, a pretty long cycle. Then you so, get this one. Uh, that, that's from a view of Saturn from its shadow. The Cassini satellite. Yep, there we go. That's the one I was talking about. Earth Cassini is in that satellite. Picture. Elements of this image furnished by NASA. That is a real picture taken by NASA, and you can find versions of that where Earth is shown in a little box out there. Yep. Is it eclipsing the sun or something? No. It's just Why is it bright around the edges? It may have been. It may have been eclipsing the sun. I can't remember. It's been too long. It's been, that's been 20 years ago. It's been a long time ago. don't remember the details of it. So planets but, you're never going to see are Pluto and things like that. I mean C. You're, you can't. I don't think you can see Pluto in a regular telescope. Yeah, absolutely you can. Not this How one. How big? Uh, you could probably see t uh, in a Newtonian, an 8 or 10 inch Newtonian, no trouble. Yeah. You can see Pluto. No trouble. Really? Yeah. It's not too small? No. You just so have to know where to look. So that's why I like and looking realize, at Saturn. And realize or that it's going to be, I mean. be very small. But it's going to be a disk. It's not going to be a pinpoint of light. And yeah. that's how you tell the difference. Like Uranus and Neptune, both. You look for the colors they are, and you look for something that is not a pinpoint of light, that is a disk. And, yeah, absolutely you can see Pluto. I've seen Pluto. My, I never found Pluto my, myself. My girlfriend's dog is named Pluto, so I guess I've seen See, Pluto you can see dog. Pluto right there. All right. I pet Pluto this morning. You pet him? Yeah. Did you scratch him behind his ears? No. Oh, come on. That's where dogs He likes... No, no, no. He's got this right in front of his right leg. If you scratch there, he tickles. There's You're... Pluto. And That's a NASA image. Yep. So... From the Pluto mission. Yeah. Um, but... You know, set expectations. That's why I like looking at uh, Jupiter, because in any telescope, you can find and see Jupiter. In any telescope, you can see Jupiter, and you can see the rings, anything more than like a two-inch telescope. Yeah. Maybe, and maybe Saturn little... is so big. Or, or Saturn. The fun part about Saturn is uh, the moons. Uh, Jupiter. Jupiter, the moons. Jupiter's moons, the four Galilean moons. There are very few places in the heavens where you can see uh, movement. You can see shadow movement on the moon. You can see the sun angle changing and see movement there. You can see sunspots move on the sun. Obviously, we're going to caution you to always look at the sun through solar safe filtering. And if you have a telescope, you can get solar safe filters. Those filters always go on the front. We sell them. They're called sun catchers. They always go on the front right here. Never back here. Always on the front. And you can see Norina Faults cost this telescope. Uh, Norina is over in the carousel. Uh, She's on a different platform. Okay, so scroll through it so I can uh, can find the find it in the carousel. I think it's is it this one. Uh, that says featured now. How much is that? We'll get you a price, Noreen. Hang on just a second. 
So, so I do have the cat. Look up the price, please. I'm looking up the cat. No, how much is it? Two thirty nine ninety nine. Cat. Uh, there's the cat. They didn't like the cat. I had to take the cat down. I I liked the cat. I thought it was cool. His head looks a little bit too big for the helmet. Eh, but who you cares? Know, there's, there's that. So anyway, it's obvious it's so, not real. So, so the cat from out that, so the cat from out of the cat. out of space. That yeah. must be you. We have That's we you. have a picture of you in a Russian space suit. Is uh, it Russian? No, I don't think that's... That might be the Russian space suit. It may have been off of some movie or something, but it's definitely not a United States space suit. So, Paul, yeah. we've got a couple of minutes left. I'm going to finish explaining how to collimate, how to or align no, no. your red dot yeah. finder with this telescope. But see, you find this is about the exploration and the, the fun and enjoyment of it. But if you can't point your telescope, Paul, there's no enjoyment. <sighs> so real quick, All right. this is how you align the telescope. You find something that's farthest away that you can see. At least 300 yards, mile is better, five miles is better. You find maybe a tree line where the trees are all the same height. There's one tree that's real tall. You find that spot. You can find it, you know, follow the tree line along. Get that tall tree, the very top of it, in the center of your eyepiece. Use the red dot finder right here. It doesn't put a laser out. Just a little red dot point appears right there when you turn it on. And you put this in here, and you turn your red dot finder on. You set your target in the center of the eyepiece, and you move the red dot finder with the left right and the up-down screws that make it move until the red dot is at the very tippy top of that tree. Look in the eyepiece. You probably move the telescope a little bit. That's okay. Move the telescope back. Get it centered up again. Move the red dot. And now when they, you look in the eyepiece and look at the red dot, they're pointed at the same thing. Now you're set. You've got a good, decent alignment. Tonight when it gets dark, find a star. Uh, or in a couple of weeks, find the moon when the new moon rises. But find a bright star. Move the telescope left, right, up, and down while you're looking through the red dot finder. And you find it. Get it centered up. Look in the eyepiece. Focus the telescope. And you're going to probably see it somewhere in the field of view. So now, you got to fine-tune it just a little bit. Move the telescope left, right, up, and down very gently until you get the star centered, and then adjust your red dot finder. And now, anywhere you put the red dot, whatever you're looking at is going to be in the field of view. If your telescope, that's how you start finding stuff up in the sky with the first light, AR, 80 millimeter, 640 millimeter focal length telescope. You see right here, everything here comes with it. also comes with a smartphone adapter, so you can put it over the eyepiece and take pictures with your smartphone. Uh, it comes with a tripod, the telescope, a 25 millimeter eyepiece, the red dot finder, and the smartphone adapter. A lens cap, of course. And we're going to run up here against time right now. So I would suggest if, if you're getting this and it fits still within your budget, to go ahead and add a couple or at least one new uh, higher end eyepiece. If you're going to buy one other eyepiece, talk through the process here. If you're going to buy one other eyepiece, I would buy a 15 millimeter or a 10 millimeter uh, 52 degree eyepiece. I wouldn't buy anything with more magnification than that. I don't know, 60, 68 degree? What is it? Those get real expensive. Yeah, I'm, the, the least expensive are the 52 degree series. Right. If, but you, if have you want more better money, eye relief, you know, but you got to be careful. Make sure you're buying eyepieces that have inch and a quarter barrel, yeah. not two inch barrels. This is a 25, so you don't want to buy another 25. You don't really want to buy a 30. You don't want to buy a 20 because the magnification you get is so little. That's why going down to a 15 or a 10 is going to give you more magnification and you can see, uh, you know, things, you know, more magnified. However, if you magnify something by double, it's going to move, it magnifies the movement too. And so if it took 20 seconds to move out of the eyepiece with a 25 millimeter eyepiece in, and you go to a 12 and a half, half of 25 is 12 and a half, it took 20 seconds, now it's going to take 10 seconds to go across the eyepiece. If you go down to a 6 millimeter eyepiece, now it's going to take 
five seconds to go across the eyepiece. That's no fun because you're constantly having to move the telescope. I personally like a, like a wide field, low magnification view. So the lowest power you can get is what I do most of my viewing. And when I'm doing outreach, more than 90% of my viewing is with a low power eyepiece. So with I that, do know that Paul? you do come across good seeing more than you think. Because this last weekend, when I took the telescope out, right, I put I was down to a six and a half. Mm -hmm. And I there was no twinkling, no nothing. Yep. Nice steady air. You get it yeah. every once in a while. And it was and there was some weird gifts. nebula or something that I saw. I couldn't figure out what it was, so those are gifts. Paul, I got to go get some stuff done. Time to wrap up the show. Uh, we will be back tomorrow. It will be Thursday. It's going to be first negative. It's going to be on the wing. We're going to do a birding show. And then Friday will be focus on astrophotography. Monday next week is going to be in Tyler and Annie and Lucy's hands. Uh, I am going to be traveling to the Nebraska Star Party, a gathering of I think there's over 300 people registered this year already, Paul, uh, up uh, Merritt Reservoir where it's so dark that you can see your shadow by the light of the Milky Way. You can stand with your back to the Milky Way, let your eyes adjust and move, and you can see a shadow move, a diffuse shadow move on the ground. That, folks, is where there is very, very little light pollution. can't say no because there's a little bit, but very, very little light pollution going to spend a week up there doing astronomy with uh, uh, people up there. If you've never attended a star party, uh, find an astronomy club, club locally where you live, and they offer generally outreach nights once a month or every couple of months. Go to one of those. Uh, use their telescopes. Look through their telescopes. Talk to them about what they have and what they like, and learn to use those. That is a great way to further your skills. Um, uh, we do have one last question. Uh, the cat from outer space, you're into bird watching too. Nice, yes, absolutely, I'm working. Have restarted getting, not restarted, have started a life list. Grew up doing birding with my parents. Uh, you know, got out of the house and off to college and life and have always been interested in birds and, and watch birds, but haven't really gotten so, into uh, tracking yeah. the birds I see and trying to add birds to my list. Working on that now. I so raised Noreen, small parrots for eight years. Hey, there's breeding involved with parrots right yeah. there. Go ahead. So Noreen asked where can she purchase these. Okay, well, Noreen, you could get so, them on Amazon. Yep. Just go to Amazon and, ex and search for Explore Scientific. Find our store and you'll find our products. And you have a, a wide range of choices. Uh, but this one is specifically listed there. And if you go to the live stream that's on our page, then you'll see it in the carousel right underneath. Right. And you can purchase it from right there. And there no, are. it doesn't include, does not include a cat. And it does not so, include a cat or a parrot right. for uh, the cat from outer space. So um, if you're still watching and haven't clicked that follow button yet, we've picked up two followers today. Would be fantastic if there's one more person out there that could give us a follow before we shut down. Uh, but uh, on all the streams we have going on right now, we truly appreciate the time you're giving us, the questions you're asking, the comments you make. That makes this an enjoyable show uh, where we're interacting with people uh, from around the world. Uh, very enjoyable. Uh, certainly livens up the broadcast, just me up here droning on and explaining products. But by golly, I explained how to align your red dot finder, which is a skill you got to have if you want to enjoy your telescope. So for everybody here at Explore Scientific, and especially Paul Newton over there in the control booth, he's the... Am I disembodied or disemboweled today? You're, today you're close to being disemboweled, but you're still disembodied <laughs> uh, over in the control room, clicking the buttons. And No Menard, who is over there in the marketplace control booth, keeps Amazon Live and other marketplaces up. Give us a wave, Noah. Hi, guys. So here's what it looked like this time. Normally it's like this. He went, hi, guys. There you go. So we got to see the front of him this time. And uh, I'm Kent Martz for Explore Scientific. We'll be back tomorrow at 2 o'clock here on Amazon Live doing a bird show. Uh, Cat from Outer Space, join us, won't you? See you all. Bye-bye.